Okay, well, welcome. My name is Alexandra sukat I am um, I'm the Community Engagement and Accountability Lead at IFRC in Geneva. Uh, welcome to this session as part of the IFRC Global Innovation Summit. Um, our session is, of course, our uh, chatbot digital litter. Um, the occasion for this session is also because today uh, we are launching a piece of research on chatbots um, that we have conducted with the engine room uh, with support for uh, the Global Center for Preparedness of the American Red Cross. And I'm going to share right now in the chat um, the actual link to uh, the chatbot research, uh, which um, is really fresh off the press. So happy to share it with you all today. Um, so today uh, we're going to share a little bit some of the findings of the research, but mostly we're going to have a conversation with um, a few of our speakers um, who I will introduce in a second um, about chatbots um, and looking at use cases that they've used in the past, how it's worked, what they've learned from them, and also try to come up with um, some ideas on what we could do next as a community to help uh, humanitarian organizations to make better decisions around the use of chatbots. So uh, the reason really uh, for um, the research that we just shared with you in the chat, um, personally and professionally, I'm quite a, a skeptic when it's come to, to chatbots um, and also a lot of digital solutions. I think we've seen over the past uh, decade a proliferation of different digital solutions. Each time we have a new emergency, uh, we come up with a new tool, um, a new trend. Um, and often I find that these tend to not work. But I like to look at the positive. And so today I want to see what has worked, but also what are the challenges that we face. And so the research um, came about mostly because, especially during uh, the COVID pandemic, we saw a proliferation of chatbots. Given that we couldn't do as much face-to-face -face interaction uh, during the pandemic, uh, we we saw a lot of Red Cross, uh, Red Cross and national societies who were wanting to use chatbots to as a way, as a solution, uh, to better communicate with with people um, during the pandemic. And, and for us, that was a little bit worrying because we felt there wasn't enough guidance out there or even research to know, are chatbots actually useful? Is it the best way to communicate with people? And how should we go about it? So this is why we convened um, a group of, uh, of people, of protectioners, to start looking into this question. And the engine room uh, conducted this research uh, with us. Um, so today um, on, uh, on this session, uh, we have John Warrens from UNHCR who contributed to this research, um, and he has been working um, on digital solutions with the UNHCR Innovation Lab for quite some time. Um, we have uh, Jonat from Netherlands Red Cross um, from 510, um, who has been supporting uh, quite a few national societies, not only with digital solutions, but also uh, with chatbots. And then we have, of course, Haley Burgess from um, American Red Cross, who um, will share with us quite a few use cases as well from, from AMCROSS, which are quite interesting. And from IFRC, we have uh, Napoleon, who's with us, who will be uh, talking uh, a little bit um, on a different topic, if I can say, around the use of AI uh, to analyze uh, feedback and what we've learned um, by using uh, some tools around AI in, in that process. Um, so to begin with, I just want to share with you some of the key findings from, from the research. Um, and Engine Room really uh, identifies five main findings uh, throughout the research, uh, which you can see, of course, in exhibit summary of the in, with the link that we shared in, in the chat now. But some of them that I found, um, you know, nothing I think was necessarily groundbreaking, of course, or surprising, but I think it's really useful to have these on paper and to be reminded of them. Uh, one of them, of course, which is one of my pet peeves, um, is around um, the need to really first identify the problem, um, the, and secondly, the solution, and then thirdly, the tech. Um, and often I've seen in, in our environment that uh, we sometimes identify the solution and the tech together before really understanding the problem. So I think it's a good reminder of really identifying the, the problem first before uh, we figure out if a, a chatbot is actually the best tool um, to be used. Another aspect um, is to really uh, look at contextual considerations in terms of really to see um, if uh, how who we want to reach in, in what context, right? Um, to see if the chatbot is actually going to be useful for the organization. Um, because we have to remi remember, of course, that different people might use chatbots and others don't, of course. So are we really going to be inclusive? So perhaps we'll only be targeting young people while they're um, maybe um, uh, older. Older members of the community prefer using, you know, of course, have in-person meetings or interactions. 
Um, another aspect as well that I think is really uh, important, I think hopefully in the conversation today, we'll talk a little bit about that is around digital accountability and responsible data. Um, so how are we really uh, using the data um, through uh, the, uh, the use of a chatbot? Uh, what data is collected? How is it stored? How is cons consent really achieved? Um, so these are really uh, huge questions that we start touching on into the research, but we realize that really needs a lot more thinking and guidance as well. So I'm hoping we're going to, you know, identify some of these issues today and kind of um, brainstorm some of these uh, with you. So the first part of this session, we're going to um, have our um, guest speakers today to present to us some of the use cases they've been working on. And then as a second part, we'll have a discussion with you, our audience, uh, through Mentimeter uh, and ask you a few questions and, and um, have a conversation on, on the use of chatbots. So um, to start with, um, I would ask Don if you can just come on um, online now with us. And just tell us about one use case that you've um, you've worked on, um, and from that, one thing that you've learned, one thing that uh, worked well, and one thing that didn't work well. Off to you. Uh, great, thanks, Alex, and thanks everybody for taking the time to be with us today. I'm happy to talk about a pilot that UNHCR has worked on in using chatbots, and this is where we partnered with um, a private company, Turn.io, who are linked to the Preco Foundation to. Uh, basically um, undertake a sort of large-scale pilot around uh, chatbots within the innovation service, basically at the height of COVID, and it's been running to date. At the moment, um, rather than this being a sort of global uh, chatbot per se, it's actually uh, implemented in specific countries. Um, I think we're live in over 15 now with approximately 80,000 users, and it's very created bespoke to the uh, the needs of communities in those countries led by UNHCR field teams. Uh, there's more information online. I can share a couple of blog posts in the uh, chat where we explain a bit about what we did. But with this approach, we, we were taking data protection and uh, data, data subject rights very, very seriously and made sure that we implemented a solution where we had uh, a lot of control over the data. We were minimizing the data captured by design. Of course, there is some metadata captured through uh, these services when we're using something. Uh, the primary platform it was focused on was WhatsApp, just to say. Um, but we did do that, and we also provided information to communities about uh, their data subject rights, what they were signing up to, and allowing them the ability to delete their data. So we really tried to have data protection and privacy at the core of this service. And the use case was primarily, and it differed per country in terms of how country teams wanted to use it, uh, but mainly around general information sharing, quite a, a normal starting use case for a pilot. But in certain cases, we elaborated a bit more and had uh, different types of solutions that we took. So to the other questions, what did we learn? Well, I think that what we learned was that the teams who invested the most HR time into the chatbot got the most out of it. It wasn't something where, um, you know, if you just sort of flick the switch on the automation, allow the chatbot to do its thing, you know, it would work and it would provide the service. But really, what things came into their own when there was more staff time in terms of reviewing messages, looking at what was coming in, being able to answer and switch from automated responses to human responses. And that actually enabled a much more creative use of the platform and uh, more meaningful transactions between individuals and UNHCR through that additional uh, time investment from, from the staff. Um, the one thing that worked well was actually um, by investing time where we saw teams who actually invested this time, it would actually save them time in the long run. What I mean by this is that where we would have protection staff handling queries, maybe face to face or so on, we would actually be able to deal with many things through the chatbot um, to sort of triage, to allow for more serious cases to be raised for those colleagues and them to address them through that platform, which actually then saved time. And I think the figures we were looking at were sort of one to one and a half hours per day of protection staff time due to the fact that we, um, we were working through this platform. So that was one thing that worked really well. And we had positive feedback from the particular country team uh, who, who worked on that. And that was uh, the colleagues in Ecuador. Um, one thing that didn't work well, um, often we would sometimes rely on on technology <laughs> to do various things something that happens all the time is sort of automated tagging of issues or raising things through automation 
to the attention of humans. And that actually was something that we found quite challenging, not because of anything particular linked to the platform we were using, but just the nuances and complexity of the issues that we were looking at really required humans to be actually looking and, and reviewing this, particularly when we're dealing with sensitive issues ranging from protection concerns, maybe violence against women or other um, specific needs that uh, forcibly displaced people might face. Um, yeah, we would need to uh, to look into that. So, Alex, that's my my sort of top line from that use case from you and HCR. Thank you, John, so much. Uh, maybe one thing I want to ask you: you said that it would um, ultimately was only useful to that team specifically, and just wanting to see if you could expand a little bit on that. What you meant, like as opposed to the whole organization as a whole, or yeah. Uh, well, no, that was that was, that fact was just from that use case in the team. Okay. We didn't actually look into it for others. But what was interesting within the number of 15 lines, we did this in 15 country teams. Uh, what I was saying about the investment in terms of the time from start, we saw we saw some investing more time and some investing less time. And it was yeah. much more effective where you actually had more staff who had either as part of their TORs or dedicated functions to actually work with the platform to be monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not something that you could just switch on and leave and let let be. It was actually something that required consistent follow-up and support to be yeah. make it most effective. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, next one up is uh, Jonas. And I know you want to share um, or your screen with us. And please, of course, introduce yourself directly and um, go ahead. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, John, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonat. I work as the digital CEA specialist at 510, the data and digital team of the Netherlands Red Cross. And I would like to start, like Alex said, with sharing my screen to walk you really briefly through a WhatsApp-based chatbot that is currently being used uh, by the domestic department of the Netherlands Red Cross. They are running a large scale school meals program targeting around 100,000 uh, people in the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> that is also uh, exactly the reason why we started looking into using a chatbot because there is a small help desk uh, that is there to answer questions from the people who are uh, receiving support through this program. But because it's such a large scale, we knew that the team wasn't going to be able to answer every single question coming in. And that's uh, the main reason behind the development of this chatbot. So I will briefly demonstrate how it works um, and then answer uh, the same questions that John, uh, that John answered. Um, so let me write an, in an introduction message. Um, in this case, the first the first automated reply coming from the chatbot is in Dutch, as is as it's the primary language uh, in the Netherlands context. Um, but I will switch to English uh, for the sake of this demo. But this is also something that um, that the people using the chatbot can do, so they can choose another language um, when that is relevant uh, for them. The same uh, introduction message comes back. Uh, I'm not going to read everything out uh, simply because uh, we only have a few minutes per uh, per use case. Um, but what I do want to point out is that immediately we give people the option to either use the chatbot to find an answer to their question by themselves or to be directly connected to uh, to an agent working with the Netherlands Red Cross. Um, and then they can ask uh, their question there. They remain within the same conversation uh, on WhatsApp. Um, but for now, we're going to use the bot. <clears throat> oh, for some reason, it is giving me the second option. Okay, that's very unfortunate. I'm, I'm sorry about this. We're using a demo version that is also being worked on at the same time. Um, so for now, what I will do is I will stop sharing my screen and I will just uh, walk you through the flow uh, verbally. So the way this bot works, and we call it a self-service bot rather than a chat bot. Um, and we're doing this because um, it's actually a, not a question answer style throughout, but the, the flow asks the people what uh, what topic they're interested in, what, the, what topic they have a question about, and it links them to an external knowledge base um, with a link from the WhatsApp conversation where they can find all of the frequently asked questions and the answers um, 
within the context of the topic that they have a question about. So this, this provides them the opportunity to find the answer to the question themselves um, without the agent having to answer every single question uh, coming in. And this also gives them the opportunity to maybe find additional answers to additional questions that they, that they have on top of the one that they started reaching out um, with or for. Um, one of the things that we've learned and one of the main reasons for linking the chatbot to this um, external knowledge base is also so that we um, give the control of the content to the CEA person that is working within the context of the project and the programmatic team themselves. So we know very often information changes. For example, the, the deadline for registration for the program uh, gets extended. Um, or uh, any any other step in the process changes. So in this um, in this case, that means that the CA focal point and the programmatic people are in control of updating the information themselves. So they're not dependent on a technical focal point or an IT person uh, to do that. What has worked really well in this case is also it has been. Um, it has shown to be a really concrete reason for close collaboration between the CA focal point, a relatively new role within the Netherlands Red Cross, uh, and the programmatic team to really come together and um, um, agree and align on uh, the content to share, uh, but also the structure of the content, the tone of voice of the content, and really um, to make sure that it's targeting the target group in the best way possible. Um, what maybe hasn't worked so well is is actually also touching upon that same uh, touching upon that same process is that there were so many different people involved that there were so many different versions of of an FAQ that were created um, that it actually took a little bit more time than you would want to get everything together as a first sort of lean version that is that is ready to be used um, for a chatbot or a self service bot um, like this. And so I think there are there are definitely some some wins in uh, in facilitating that process from a CA point of view as well. And one other thing that I would like to highlight here, not necessarily something uh, as something that hasn't worked well, but what we simply don't don't know well enough is how do the people using the chatbot actually experience it? And this is something that I think. Um, um, sometimes still within the, the context of working with chatbots is still a little bit unknown. Like one, one perspective is, okay, how does it work from a, from a national society point of view and the, and the, and the people working on the, on the chatbot from that perspective? But the other, the other and perhaps a, maybe even the more important per, uh, perspective is how does it actually work uh, for people interacting with the chatbot? And this is something that in the context of the Netherlands, we will do, um, we will do testing on. Uh, to get more insights in there as well, and to use those in, insights to uh, to improve uh, the process and the chatbot itself. Back to you, Alex. Thanks so much, Janet, and sorry for the if it was a demo, but just shows bugs happen with tech with humans. It's not straightforward always, but I think it's super interesting what you mentioned around um, having different versions of the FAQ and the content, and I, because often. What's most complicated, I find personally, is not necessarily the tech, the solution in itself, but it's the back end, which would be an issue no matter what channel you use, right? Whether a digital channel or even in person, yeah. having that content ready and um, updated and accurate is is usually quite um, a big challenge, right? Great. So, exactly. yeah. Um, and just a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions for speakers as they go, they they talk about their user case, please put them in the chat and hopefully um, they can also answer you directly in the chat or, of course, um, here um, live. So thank you so much. Um, OK, so next, um, Haley, um, you're up next to tell us a little bit more about um, some of the use cases you've um, you've worked with. Hi, thank you so much, Alex. So at, I'm Haley, and I'm with the American Red Cross. Um, and at at our organization, we have a few different use cases for um, chatbots and conversational AI in general. Um, we have uh, we have one chatbot that is focused internally on employees and HR questions. We have another that is on the RedCrossBlood.org site to, to handle um, scheduling and eligibility questions around blood donation. Um, but the one I wanted to focus on today is our disaster response chatbot um, that is on 
the redcross.org website and is primarily um, answering questions around disaster relief and recovery services, um, but also help. And one of the main functions of that is helping users find, find a disaster relief shelter near them. Um, we found this is our most used function in the disaster response chatbot is using is using it to find is to find, is using it to find a shelter, um, and we found this to be really effective in helping just helping people um, mm. connecting them with a shelter near them. Um, this is our as I mentioned our most used function and. What has worked really well about it, I think, is the ease of use of that conversational interface um, where. It's the same shelter information that is on our website, but having it returned within the text window and being able to enter your zip code and receive that link to the closest shelter to you and open it immediately in Google Maps um, has been a really useful um, interface, especially for our chatbot users, most of whom are using a mobile device and in a situation that is potentially <clears throat> urgent or your, you know, your um, you might not have access to a, another device. Um, being able to locate something in that mobile mobile setting, um, we found to be really effective. Um, something that we've that we've learned through this use case in particular, but also you know throughout our chatbot work, is the importance of you know really regular regularly monitoring and maintaining the knowledge base and the data that the chatbot has to make sure that it is serving our audiences and serving the communities that are engaging with it. Um, so a couple things to that effect is that we have we have the chatbot available in English and Spanish. All of the content um, that is on that is on the disaster response chatbot in English is replicated uh, in Spanish to serve to serve those users. And then we also uh, something that has come out of regular monitoring has been that a significant proportion of our of users who were looking to find a shelter were not looking for a disaster response shelter, they were looking for a homeless shelter. Um, and so something we were able to do based on review of that, of that information was add a response um, to the chatbot to direct, to direct folks to more relevant uh, social services in their area or government organizations um, that might be able to help with uh, homelessness services rather than giving them a pretty unsatisfying answer of, you know, oh, no shelter has been located near you because there wasn't a disaster response shelter lo um, location available in their area. Um, something that that hasn't really that hasn't really worked well. Uh, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. Um, we have tried given given the you know fact that finding a shelter is one of our most used is our most used function um, in this chatbot. We tried to encourage more people um, to use it in that way, especially in areas with an ongoing disaster by changing the icon messaging and the intro messaging on the chatbot to say, you know, you can use, um, uh, hi, you can use, you can use me to find a shelter or you can ask me to find a shelter near you. Um, but we found that this didn't work well and it didn't, um, it, it didn't prompt a, an increase in people using the chatbot nor in people finding a shelter. Um, and the reason for that has appeared to be because the intent of, of folks using the chatbot but might be, you know, to get to get assistance and to find uh, disaster relief. But the intent of most visitors um, to our website is not is not that. Um, so I think something I really wanted to highlight was the importance of, you know, matching the intent of of the chatbot to the overall platform that it's on. So since our our chatbots are hosted on the website, we're you know serving a lot of different audiences, and the importance of you know putting the chatbot into that overall journey um, with how people are relating to and, at, and interacting with your organization rather than you know treating the chatbot as a more discrete um, entity has, has really emerged as, as important for us. Yeah, back to you, Alex. Thank you, Haley, super interesting. Um, I think that question around intent and expectation is often <laughs> something uh, we face, right? And um, I think that was one of the main findings as well of the research was around kind of managing expectations, right? Um, we might set up a, a chat bot for, or even any digital tool for a specific reason, but then people might come to use it for something else, right? I think we had an instance as well around, um, I forget, I think it was, we set up a chat bot around COVID and then people were coming to ask questions around food aid, right? Um, so 
you know, obviously there's work that needs to be done in terms of um, managing expectations, but also being clear about what the, the, the bot can do and not do, right? So yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, so uh, last but not least, Napoleon, do you want to come in for a couple of minutes to tell us a little bit more about your experience more probably uh, using AI, so in a different way, uh, using different channels for different purposes, but can you tell us a little bit about that and what specifically answering the same questions as our colleagues um, in terms of what you've learned in the process and what worked well and didn't work well? Everyone, uh, good afternoon or good thing to everybody find yourself on the time zone. Okay, I'm Napoleon uh, Meme. Uh, I'm a community feedback officer for IFRC, that's Africa region. I'll be talking about uh, CUDA. That's the use case uh, we have experience on in IFRC Africa region. So virtually CUDA is a uh, AI technology that we're using. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, you can understand we're receiving a uh, thousands of feedback coming from close to 40 national societies around Africa. And you can bear with me that uh, to be able to code that information and analyze it on time is quite difficult. So this information was uploaded into CODA and then uh, CODA is able to code it for us faster uh, using a three level structure. It codes it first of all, the types of feedback that we receive. Then later on it codes it equally pay the categories and giving it, attributing it specific codes. So with that, uh, it, it, it actually went, uh, our coding actually went faster. So uh, one thing I've learned uh, from using AI technology for coding feedback data is that, um, well, it still requires uh, human intervention, as I'll put it. Uh, though AI technology is designed to facilitate uh, or support our team in our work, we should not really over rely on it, you see. Because uh, at a certain level, as I said, uh, AI the AI technology we're using, it had to code our data per types, per categories, and per codes. But at a certain level, you will discover that when it gets to the level of categories and codes, it became a little bit more uh, unreliable. So at that level, you still need to uh, specifically go through the codes and maybe collect, correct some of the codes and categories that you, the person coding, you, the person working on it, you need to equally teach the system to be able to understand how the system will equally attribute the categories and codes to the feedback that will be uploaded. So if you are not very consistent on how you are coding the feedback, uh, well, the, the technology too might not be very consistent. Um, then uh, one thing that worked well, uh, you can understand with me too that uh, during the COVID pandemic, a lot of rumors were spreading. And using AI technology, we're able to put this data faster and then maybe uh, have a real-time interpretation of the data and stop maybe the spread of some rumors that will have taken us uh, maybe a longer time to address. So it, it was really useful at this level because you know with rumors, if you don't stop them on time, uh, what is not true can end up being what uh, the population thinks is true. So using AI technology, it helped us to maybe stop some of these uh, uh, rumors on time. Mm, then uh, one thing that didn't work well, as I said uh, earlier, AI technology requires a lot of time and dedication to set it up. You know, uh, the technology has to learn from you, uh, the person we're putting it in place. So as I said earlier, you have to be very consistent on how you are coding data so that it knows that, okay, when I receive information related to this, this is how I code it, this is how I can categorize it. So if you are not very consistent, as they usually say, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you are not very consistent, as, I, as I'm saying, AI technology might not be very consistent in itself to, uh, to work. So it still requires uh, a lot of uh, uh, staff intervention. So that's what I can say didn't really work well. Uh, back to you, uh, Alex. Thank you so much, Napoleon. I think this is interesting. It's coming up as well, the issue around consistency, right? That we need to be, everything needs to be consistent if they are going to work. Unfortunately, human interactions are not necessarily consistent. So how do we match that up? Um, for the next part of the session, we're going to be sharing a Mentimeter for all of you to, um, to participate in the discussion. So test if you can uh, put the link um, into the chat for everybody to join in. And maybe while you're doing that test and people are logging into uh, Mentimeter, um, 
I think there's a, a question in the chat for Haley, and sorry to put you on the stop, Haley, on the spot, but I think it's interesting because um, it's a, a question from Christelle around the fact that, of course, district people who are distressed, who are affected by a situation, uh, might prefer, of course, interacting with humans rather than chatbots. So how do you decide how, in, in, in the use cases that you just shared with us, how did you decide about going digital versus um, maybe actually encouraging more human interaction in these situations? Yeah, of course, there's a good question. And I was actually just um, just replying um, to Crystal, so I'm glad that you asked. Um, but I think the main the main thing that we've tried to do is is focus the chatbots on things that 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 will help people get information easier um, rather than kind of replacing the need for you know talking to a person, for example, um, if if a lot of the home fire situations that the American Red Cross responds to are much more um, are really complicated, and you know you need to you need to talk to someone um, about that distressing situation. Um, and so, if someone indicates in the chatbot that they have been a victim of a home fire recently, they're immediately directed um, to call our phone number um, to get assistance that way. Um, and so, we've really tried to when things when there are use cases that really shouldn't be shouldn't be automated or you just need you're just going to need to call um to just direct direct people in the right to the right place whether that's to the right phone number or to the or to the, a relevant online inquiry form something like that where they're at least getting some information that helps them helps them decide you know what to where to go next and and how to and how to get help and so that's been our been our approach thanks so much um, so for the next part of this discussion, as I said, um, we'll go on Mentee. So if all of you could look at the chat, click on the link. Um, there's also a voting code there. So please join in um, so that we can um, answer some questions together. So um, if you want to share your screen as well so that we can see the, the questions on the screen here and as well, um, we can share the results more easily. Thank you, Tessa. I could probably take part myself, although I will be. Uh... OK. So as you answer the questions that we have there, um, oh, I'm seeing, wait, which question is first? Just checking because when I logged in, I saw different questions. So I don't want to confuse everyone. Okay. Um, so I guess this first question we had, which I think is the first one, if I'm logging in, I see a different question. So I just want to make sure, yes, do you want to share your screen with the first question? So we have about five questions. One second, but it, it was uh, said it is already projected for somebody. One second. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the first question um, that we had for you, very simple, um, just because sometimes we forget ourselves, we are, you know, users as well. Um, so of course, I've interacted with a chatbot and found it useful. Personally, if I'm going to be completely honest, very rarely, <laughs> but maybe I haven't interacted in my, you know, in my own personal life and with chatbots enough, but I find often it's useful for, to find very basic information for opening times of certain services and whatnot. Uh, but I feel so often, as soon as you push a little bit further, um, it can get frustrating quite um, quite uh, quite quickly. So my answer would probably be in between yes and no. But I see here that 77% uh, of people so far um, interact with the chatbot and find it useful. And no one here on the call has never used a chatbot, which is interesting. I don't know, uh, speakers. Any experience so far, John, uh, Haley, or uh, I know you not had to uh, to leave for for another session as part of the summit, so she's not with us um, anymore. Or Napoleon, Haley, and John, uh, anything you'd like to say on that? You've you're using chatbots yourself on a daily basis, I'm assuming. Um, if I can avoid using them, I probably would. Um, <laughs> I think I think for me, and and this comes to a question in the chat that I was just about to click enter on, which was from um, uh, Thomas, which was just about being clear about what 
the service is and what it isn't. And I think that that's where people get frustrated when they think they can achieve a goal or achieve a task through a chatbot that they actually can't achieve. Maybe they can't get the personal support that they're requesting. And that is often coming down to how it's presented. And to this end, I, I actually find sometimes the chatbots that aren't leaning on AI as much, where there's an attempt to sort of be more intelligent about that, but where, where it's sort of more a more simple structure where you kind of know what you're getting can actually be um, an easier experience from a user. But I think people have different perspectives on this, which is why uh, user testing of whatever solution you're doing is so important. Yeah, totally. And I think this is a good point because usually when we think about chatbots, at least in our in my environment, people think AI right away. Like they don't differentiate that there might be different types of, of chatbot, as you said, and especially, especially the simple ones where um, it might be easier to interact with and get additional content, right? Okay, but uh, I guess we have, you know, we only, we only have 30 people who responded, but 70% of people have interacted with Chabot and found it useful, which is which is interesting. Haley, any comments on this for Napoleon before we move to the next question? I think I, I um, agree with a lot of what John said in terms of, you know, really setting those expectations of, you know, this is what you can use this chatbot for. I found the most success with using chatbots um, that are, that are really designed for one or a couple of things when it's something like a customer service chatbot or you know this is what you can you can either talk to an agent or you can process something this way or register for something this way um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind as we talk about you know how can you build effective chatbots and it's really you know can you get from can you get from A to B is it a clear cut um, use exactly. case or more general information great yeah exactly thank you Okay, next question. Tessa, if you can. Oh, P okay, people have already answered. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if people can still answer if, or if it's final, just because I see we have only 25 people who answered and we have 57 participants. So hoping for more people to log in to answer. But um, yeah, so our next question, do you think decision makers in your organization are looking at chatbots as a silver bullet for effective community engagement through digital platforms? Um, here we have more than half of people who say no. The others say, I don't know. Very small percentage say yes so far. Um, for, I mean, if I can answer that question myself, I, um, I think there is a tendency to want to rely on, on, on chatbots or digital solutions. Uh, generally, this might not be chatbots specifically, but there is definitely an appetite um, given that our world has gone through this huge digital transformation. Um, I think for us, there's a definite appetite to use chatbots uh, to make things more effective, um, but we do realize that it doesn't necessarily make things more effective, right? So we have to be careful in doing that. But um, I would say probably more yes than no in our case, but um, what about you, John, and UNHCR? I know that you're not speaking on behalf of all of UNHCR, but... Um... Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I'm kind of surprised actually that there's as many no answers yeah. as uh, as there is. Um, but I mean, that's a, that's a positive thing there. I think, um, you know, I mean, it's it's no no surprise building off what you were saying, Alex, about the external environment. You know, not only have we uh, had this digital transformation, but we've also had you know a mounting number of uh, crises, whether conflict or forced displacement, alongside um, you know a narrowing financial space for many humanitarian organizations. And um, often one of the driving factors can be things around efficiencies, um, you know, from decision makers. Um, and this co sometimes comes at tension with, with providing an effective service, where maybe the, a greater amount of investment is required in order to make that happen. And I think uh, it becomes a, a complex um, issue. And I would say that, um, you know, while not a silver bullets um you know there is a need for investment in these types of solutions uh, and that isn't going to pay dividends immediately but in the longer term when you when you build out a robust plan built on uh community preferences channels they they turn to and trust uh, and establish a sort of digital as well as offline ecosystem for community engagement you can actually build out a wide array of programming that is not a silver bullet, but actually can really help the organization by building greater amounts of meaningful transactions with individuals to help solve their problems more quickly. And that that in turn will have 
benefits in terms of return on investment for the organization itself, but it's not something that happens overnight. Yeah, and I think also what I see often is that we want to create our own platforms, um, our own branded, especially platforms or chatbots or whatever it may be, uh, because if not, then you know we want to be visible as opposed to maybe meeting communities in their digital space, um, because then we don't we have less control and ownership, right? So that that for me, that's that's why I would answer yes in this case, right? Uh, a little bit because of that. I don't know, Napoleon. Uh, yes, go ahead. I was going to call on you in the Africa region. What is the the feeling there, in your opinion? Yeah, Alex. But I will want to talk instead about AI technology. To see, yeah. let's see if uh, uh, decision makers they really uh, are looking at it as uh, a silver bullet for effective community engagement. I will say uh, no. Even though there's also a yes in it, but I'll say no. Why? Because uh, I think uh, AI technology shouldn't take away that uh, 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 human element from community engagement, as uh, AI technology will still require staff intervention to be able to properly interpret uh, the large amount of data it is uh, receiving. So if we think, uh, maybe if decision makers think that is the final solution, maybe to data analysis, I think they will be taking away that uh, human uh, element of, uh, of, the, of uh, data analysis and community engagement. So I think I will probably go for a no. Over. Sorry, I was in mute. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe a combination of, of both, right, would be more interesting to look at, right? And not have a silver bullet, um, as we say. Okay, so maybe we can jump to the next question. Okay, so I guess this was meant to be a bit more of a word cloud, but I'm not sure it worked that way. But anyway, we can just maybe have a chat on that. In your organization, do you have chatbot advocates and chatbot skeptics? Is it easy to find common ground between them? This was a question that you proposed, John, which I think was, was interesting. Um, but maybe Haley, given that uh, your work is really around uh, AI, right, and chatbots, um, how do you deal with this at, at American Red Cross, or just generally in in in, the, in your field? Um, how do you find common ground between the skeptics and the the advocates? Yeah, definitely. I think we definitely have a lot of. Except, or we have a lot of openness, I'd say, to different types of types of inter, uh, innovation and using new digital technologies or um, emerging technologies um, for use cases. But something that that really helps, you know, get over that hurdle of skepticism, or you know, is this really going to help? Is having that defined, as you were mentioning, kind of at the beginning of this call, is having that defined problem of you know how is how is this really going to help? The people that we're serving, what is the exact problem uh, being addressed and how are we going to fix it? Having that defined is really the key, I think, to finding common ground between people who might be a little bit more skeptical, um, especially around emerging, especially around chatbots and as as generative AI has become more, you know, talked about and popular. And of course, there are so many unproven aspects to it and, and risks associated that really making sure that there's been a lot of groundwork done on scoping an exact problem and how this can fix it and and what the technology looks like um, is, I think, the key to, to finding that common ground. Thank you. Um, yeah, a few people are putting in some of their thoughts here on Menti, which is great to see. Um, I think, yeah, there's What's interesting is that you know some of the conversation might not be so much just about chatbots, but more about right digital technology generally. Um, in a lot of ways, sometimes the humanitarian space feels way behind from private sector and other sectors, right, in using technology. So I think we're you know chatbots is still kind of something new for us to to explore, right? Um, John, anything on this that you want to share in your experience at UNHCR or elsewhere? Um. Yeah, it's interesting uh, to read the responses. I hope I can get access to these later. I mean, I think we some people are saying that people can be both at the same time. Uh, I think you definitely do have some people who maybe veer more towards one side than the other, whether that's, you know, um, you know, somebody people were mentioning in the chat, you know, the, the sort of um, the element of like working face to face with people and the, the, the proximity and how important that is to maintain. And I think that um, 
you know, conversations like this are important, you know, to be able to bring in different perspectives. And it's great that we're able to be here today to talk about this building off also some really uh, useful research and insights that actually tries to bring a degree of objectivity and, and nuance to what sometimes is quite, a, a, at least in the past, I've, I've seen this uh, outside, uh, you know, in the community in general, it's sometimes a one-sided conversation. And I think that there are some reasons for this, because it can also be how organizations are even structured, where we have, um, you know, specific teams looking at, let's say, digital solutions, uh, maybe, you're missing the community-based protection element of that. And actually the need to integrate these different perspectives together ends up building a much richer um, suite of solutions. And this is where I would say it's not about one sort of solution that, hey, let's build it and implement it and that's that. It's actually about creating that ecosystem that matches the needs of a diverse community. You know, whenever you look at and, and do a sort of information communication needs assessment, maybe you'll see some people whose preference it is to be using messaging apps as a priority, but maybe it's only 30% of that population. And uh, maybe you're going to need to look at other solutions. And I think that that's sometimes what I see is that there's kind of a binary in terms of solution building between offline and online. And actually, the reality is that you need to have online solutions that you dispose of digital channels as much as you need offline ones and for them to work well in tandem together to create that ecosystem that meets the needs of a diverse community. So I think that having these conversations together, building this research base and not oversimplifying things, but rather looking for that complexity and that middle ground is really where this conversation will head. And this uh, research report that IFRC has led on is a great sort of springboard to this next step of the, the conversation. Thanks, John. Super useful comments there. And um, yeah, we'll definitely um, share the, the results of this with, with all of you, because I think there's some, some interesting um, thoughts here from, from the audience. We only have 10 minutes left of the session already. An hour is probably too short for everything we want to cover. But uh, maybe, Tessa, we can jump to the next question, uh, because I think this is um, the next question. Um, is quite important for all of us because as we work um, on, on this issue around uh, using chatbots and AI and just digital technology uh, generally, um, and now that we have this piece of research that is really an overview of what a lot of practitioners have to say on the use of chatbots, um, we're at the point where we really want to understand a little bit more what do people need uh, to make better decisions about the use of chatbots. Uh, for one thing, um, I think uh, for us, I think what is, what I've seen and what I've heard is is needed is really a bit of a decision tree, if I can say. Um, when do you, you know, how do you decide if a chatbot um, will be useful or not for the problem that you have, right? Um, and as I said earlier, you know, um, sometimes we look at digital tech or um, solutions a little bit too quickly before really understanding the problem that we're trying to address. Um, so I think uh, more guidance, in my opinion, on what is uh, what decisions do you need to make and or can you make depending on the problem that you have at hand, right? But again, this is not just a decision tree that can be a quick fix, right? I think it's it's, it's those conversations and understanding of those ecosystems that um, that exist, like John John was talking about. Um, maybe Napoleon, I don't know what what do you think in terms of AI specifically? What are the some of the things you think um, we need to to have in terms of guidance, tools, or whatnot? Uh, to make better decisions about the use of chatbots or AI. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yes, yes Alex. So I think you've just said it. I think I talk uh, on the table to me. I think uh, uh, there is there are lots of technology available out there, and uh, you know, I think uh, so. If we need to be really use uh, AI technology, I think we need to have some guidance and some tools available to be able to use it. Because I'm thinking here about. Just imagine maybe you need to consolidate or maybe some analysis about some data, maybe Africa region, Europe, Asia, and then uh, every organization is using something different. There are no standards. You can imagine how difficult that is uh, to be able to do that job. So if there are some guidance and maybe some tools, uh, maybe setting some standards on what type of AI technology should be used, I think it's going to help us a great deal. Back to you, Alex. Great, thank you, Napoleon. And what I'm seeing here as well, and Menti a lot, is around data protection. I think this is always a huge question um, for everything we do in terms of understanding the data protection considerations, the limits, the ethics around it, um, especially in terms of 
building and maintaining community trust, right, which is super essential in, in all the work that we do. Um, so that's definitely something that seems to be popping up. But I know a lot has been done in terms of understanding data protection. Um, Haley, John, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Jump in. I'll hesitate. Go ahead, Haley. Sure, sure. I was going to comment. A little, I agree that the, the data protection and security elements are really are really key here, as well as you know understanding AI governance and, and how are we building how are we building AI tools in a way that is that is uh, that is ethical and that meets that meets the organizations and the community's needs. I was going to comment as well on the piece of um, what is needed, you know, to make decisions about chatbots, and I think this was something that came out of the research as well was understanding the ongoing maintenance and resources needed to really to really keep up that evaluation piece. Um, and this goes into data protection as well, but making sure that the organization not only has the desire and the ability to deploy a chatbot initially, but to make sure that it's continually maintained, that you know there's no security issues going on, um, that we're continuing to iterate on the chatbot to make sure that that answer that the questions and answers that are that are in it are really useful um, for the people that are that are using it um, and there's not that mismatch between you know what the organization wants to do and, and what people actually want to use it for so I think just considering that ongoing evaluation and maintenance piece um, is is really key here thanks Haley on one in company um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to take a little bit of a different tack with this, and it's interesting because it hasn't really come up in the comments. But the first thing I would say is uh, around human resources and having people who kind of know what they're doing uh, working on it, because I've seen some organizations um, have a harder time when they look to outsource an entire solution. And uh, while there is obviously a great deal of expertise in the private sector, I think in terms of decision making, being able to have and weigh up some of this advice by having that capacity internally within a staffing contingent is actually really critical in terms of the longer term and understanding what can and cannot work. You know, generating lessons from pilots to test, to trial, to iterate, to build off that, to understand that dynamic. So I think that that is really critical. The second thing I would add in my three is around actually turnkey solutions. What I mean by this is one of the things with our use case, we, I mentioned earlier, we had it established in 15 lines. We didn't set that up at the beginning. We started with one. Um, but by having that ability to have something where you've gone through, for instance, uh, data protection, uh, both from a legal standpoint, from an information security standpoint, where you go through these with that technology, you can actually have a sort of setup where you can actually think, can we do this in this way? Can we do something differently? Can we provide that solution here? And there's less pressure when it comes to, oh, do we actually need to outlay a large amount of money or go through a tedious bureaucratic contracting process to help something happen? And being able to do that takes the pressure off and gives you flexibility to really allow the solution to really meet the needs. And it's not about pushing that solution, but just saying, well, we actually have something which we could use if there's a need. And that actually can bring you benefits in terms of decision making because you don't have the high overheads that you might have, um, which obviously then can influence that decision making from an impact standpoint. And then the last thing, which is for me the most critical, is actually feedback from users. And I see a number of people uh, writing this in the chat that um, fundamentally, if users are not happy and it's not working for them, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, and actually, that is really the guiding parameter. But like I said, if you don't have staff who understand that user data, who can analyze it, know what it means, how it should influence the service, you know, working with the technology that you have and understand and have a good relationship with maybe a vendor, then that becomes very tricky. So that's why I would tie those three things together. But to the point in the um, many of the comments, data protection is fundamental there, and you, you should be building that in from the staffing understanding and how the staff members approaching it through to any turnkey solutions that you might have and making sure that that's fully integrated as a concept there. Thanks so much uh, to both of you. We have about two minutes left, and I promised Heather we would try to end on time even if we start a little bit late. But um, so maybe Tessa, we can have the next question up and then maybe people can answer it while we slowly close um, the event. And of course, uh, we, we're recording this and we'll share it with all of you. 
So the last question we wanted to ask to all of you is what do you think the chatbot landscape will look like in 10 years from now? Um, thinking about how we're using it today um, and how we would like to, to use chatbots going forward and how the, the landscape is completely, of course, changing and evolving on a yearly basis. Um, maybe to close, uh, John, Napoleon, Haley, um, you want to tell us a little bit on that, how you view things, but also um, initially what the question I wanted to ask you um, is if in three words, you could say, um, you know, your advice to someone in a humanitarian organization who wanted to set up a chatbot. Um, and of course, you can't say don't do it, which probably would be my advice. <laughs> uh, but jokes aside, because I think the point around human resources, John, you made is, is so important. But uh, so if you can maybe all in one, um, in 30 seconds, 45 seconds each, tell us uh, your three word um, advice and maybe what do you think things will look like in 10 years in a minute? I'm not sure you can do that, but here's a challenge. <laughs> go, go ahead. Maybe, Lily, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I was considering a few different options, but I think the easiest or the most, the simplest way to, to say it is, you know, is it, is it better? Is it easier? I think considering, you know, that not getting caught up in, in the, in the ex exciting, you know, tech element of it, but, you know, is this a better experience for users? Is it easier to find information by using this chatbot um, or whatever task you've defined? Um, so I think just continually kind of asking yourself that question of, is is this is this easier? Um, how um, how is it helpful? Um, is is important? Great, thank you so much, Haley. Uh, Napoleon, you want to come in? And in terms of AI, I guess more generally. Yeah, in in, in three words, I can say: uh, please don't over rely on AI. Don't become AI dependent, because uh, we still need that uh, human uh, intervention in all of this. And then uh, how will it AI look like maybe in 10 years? I'm afraid it might replace, so I'm afraid it might have to replace human intervention and you know, making uh, maybe a population that is already very vulnerable, more vulnerable. So that's why my three words are, don't over rely on AI, don't become AI dependent. <laughs> over. Great, love it. Thank you so much. Fun? Uh, my three words would be engage your users um as the priority um they will tell you what's working for them and they will adapt to trends quicker than any humanitarian organization will in terms of their expectations we'll probably all be in the metaverse in a gen and generative ai metaverse in 10 years so who knows what that will look like but i don't think as napoleon was saying we're going to be removing humans from that equation even if ai will get more powerful and, and provide that sort of level of assistance that there will always be a role for humans to be engaged in that to be accountable for the content that's put through these channels whether that's building off self-service or more there's going to be humans involved and user preferences will need to be the priority thank you i guess my hope was that we would go back to you know basics and go back to small little nokia phones which i think were wonderful and the batteries lasted for two days and it was just great and i missed that year <laughs> But um, here on the Mentimeter, you see some people say it's going to be completely antiquated with other sites going to basically be used for every aspect of our work. So I think people have really diverging opinions here. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're, well, we're a couple minutes over time already. Um, thank you so much to, to you, John, Napoleon, and Haley, and of course, Yonat, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, we definitely needed more than an hour. Um, maybe next time we can do that. Um, and thanks for the audience as well for your answers. We'll share the recording with everyone. Um, and don't forget, um, is in, in, in the chat, we have the link to the chatbot research that we all contributed to. Um, and we hope to continue working on this topic and identifying things to you as well for some of your inputs today on what we need next to really uh, make better informed decisions when we, we use chatbots in the humanitarian sector. So thanks so much for your contributions. Uh, and please be in touch if you have any questions or follow up. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.